Hello friends, welcome to Catholic Sphere. Each week we have a different host and a different focus as we tackle topics important to Catholics around the globe. I'm your host this week, Johnette Williams. Today we'll be discussing the gender agenda. Though the gender of a person is immutable, being born male or female and only male or female, special interest groups and cultural thought leaders are pushing the concept that gender is fluid. Backing them is the media, popular culture, pundits, and even members of the scientific community. Here to help us separate fact from fiction and give us the light of church teaching are our guests. Dr. Stacy Trensenkos is a scientist and a theology professor who's joining us from Budapest, Hungary. She is author of the book, Particles of Faith, A Catholic Guide to Navigating Science, a fascinating and insightful read. Father Dwight Langenecker is a prolific author and priest in the Diocese of Greenville, South Carolina. Among the books he has written, Beheading Hydra, A Radical Plan for Christians, in an Atheistic Age, helps us understand the necessity of speaking the truth even when it's difficult. We also have with us Dr. Ray Grendy, a clinical psychologist. He is the host of EWTN's Living Right with Dr. Ray and EWTN Radio's The Doctor Is In. His book, Raising Upright Kids in an Upside Down World, is a must-have for parents today. All of our guest books are available for you at EWTN's religious catalog. That's EWTNRC.com. I like to call it the home of holy reminders in memory of our foundress, Mother Angelica. Well, everyone, welcome to the Catholic Sphere. I'm so happy to have you all with us today, and I'm delighted that we were able to make this program happen. We're talking about a very important topic today, one I think that is uh, a, a table discussion in many family homes, as many families are experiencing the, uh, the impact of this transgenderism on our culture of the day. I want to begin by uh, just putting forth a definition for transgenderism. When we talk about that, Dr. Ray, what are we referring to? The person says there's a disconnect between my mind, how I perceive myself, and my biology. My mind, therefore, rules. It says I don't belong in this body. Therefore, the confusion is something that is to be settled by the mind. Well, as we consider that, of course, we, we obviously know that there are biological realities that affect the human person on many levels. So what would you say would be a cause for this disconnect? We've heard the term gender dysphoria. Uh, it's a term that's used, you know, as we talk about these issues in, in secular media today. What do we mean by that? And, and is there a rise in true gender dysphoria as you see it in our culture today? Gender confusion has been around a long time. Matter of fact, there's a very, very tiny percentage of those who in fact have some definite biochemical neurological basis for the confusion. You used the word, Jeanette, you used the word, there's been a rise. No, I'm gonna to have to disagree with that. There has been an explosion. Mm -hmm. It's not a rise. Anytime you have a phenomenon that occurs at this pace in such a short period of time, you must look at social factors. What would be those social factors that we would want to begin to take a look at? Several are powerful. One, internet and social media. There's no question about this. The gender confusion right now seems to be highest among adolescent girls, which is really quite unusual because in the past, it has been among boys predominantly. That's one, and gender girls are very heavy into social media. Secondly, peer group approbation. In other words, this is something that has high approval among the peer group. Therefore, anything that is applauded on a general basis, you can assume is going to grow fast. So the peer pressure and the peer encouragement, the approval of the peer group uh, in this area is very high. And you couple that with this uh, propensity for uh, social media to proliferate this concept, and that would lead to a high explosion of this, as you're saying. And Father Dwight, we, we also know, however, that not only are those two factors at play here, but there also seems to be a cultural acceptance of this. And as we go back through the various kinds of 
uh, perspectives that have been held throughout time uh, and, and various kinds of uh, ideologies that have, that have been given uh, popular assent, we see that this could certainly be uh, another factor that would play into this. Would you agree with that? Yeah, one of the things which interests me about this phenomenon is there seems to be, at the very basics, basis of it all, a confusion about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. And I've taken in my um, marriage prep interviews now to actually say to young couples, what is a woman? What is a man? And very often they will give questions, they will give answers like, well, a woman is caring and nurturing and a man is a breadwinner and a provider. And I say, those are things that men and women, some men and women do, but what is a man? What is a woman? And they finally get round in a rather embarrassed way saying, you know, a man is a person, human person with male genitals um, and a woman is a human person with female genitalia and breasts. And I will say, and what are those things for? And they will say, well, for having children and for nurturing and nourishing children. I'll say, exactly. So a man is either a father or a potential father, and a woman is a mother or a potential mother. And artificial contraception and abortion, of course, have twisted those meanings of what is a man and what is a woman, what are those organs for? And therefore, it's no wonder that we're experiencing gender confusion because there's a general confusion in society uh, especially among young people, about what a man is and what a woman is. Mm -hmm. You know, as you share with us, it seems so clear and it seems so obvious. Uh, and so when we look at, at the effects of, of all of these cultural influences, we wonder, well, why is it that the fact uh, certainly doesn't override the fiction that is being propagated? And, and I must say, I think being used by a lot of very you know, spe specific special interest groups. And, and we come to you, Stacey, and, and we look at, at the great reality of, of science, and we look at the fact that science does indicate uh, something about the human person, as Father Dwight has just pointed out. So share with us, if you would, you know, the, the fact that gender is not something that uh, is, is um, mutable, it's not something that we can change, but rather it affects every aspect of the human person as an organism. Yes, it's in the genes. I mean, you either have XX chromosomes or XY chromosomes, and you can't go into every single cell in your body and change that. Um, it, it literally is genetic, and you are male or female. Um, and that's the science of it, and it's very simple, and that cannot be changed. Um, but what kids will tell you today is that you need to be educated on it. What they're doing is not scientific at all. They are literally rejecting physical reality. These kids today have grown up in this digital construct of the internet. And it's not just having pressure from peers and suggestions from their peer groups. It's that these kids make friends as avatars and care about them as human persons. But they will say that your gender is fluid because you can spiritually in your mind be whoever you want to be and they're they're not even just rejecting being male or female they're rejecting being human there are actually kids who also um, called furries it's this group where they, where they reject that they're even human they make up that there's some percentage of whatever animal they want to be Mm -hmm. And they'll tell you in their mind, it's not a physical reality that who you are is who in your mind you decide you are. They don't even really care about the science. You know, th this is a frightening reality that we're facing today. And I know that for, for many of our viewers today, they're saying, gee, I, I didn't even hear about that. Uh, the, the, the onslaught of this is tremendous. And in addition to that, it's also pervasive throughout the culture. And one of the questions that I have for you, Dr. Ray, you know, is, is what is the this is almost living in a delusionary world. And what is the effect of that on, on the human person in terms of their mental stability, in terms of their emotional reality, in terms of how it is that they make their way uh, through this time, through this, this very confusing topsy-turvy time? We will only see the outcome in time. We will only see what has happened as people have become so confused and in essence said, whether they admit it or not, I am God. I can change whatever reality I wish to change. If a 15 year old girl walks into my office, she weighs 82 pounds, she's five foot two. And she says, I look in the mirror and I see a fat person. At that point, we would have to deal with her body image. 
most experts would say this is a disturbed body image. It doesn't reflect reality. If that same girl walks into my office and says, I look in the mirror and I'm a boy, the culture says that is automatically what we have to accept. So the culture is very discriminating about what it decides a person can say regarding themselves and what they can't. And, and what our society is actually allowing and encouraging, when we stop to think about it in specifics, is horrific. The uh, hormone injections uh, to change a boy to a girl or vice versa, and then finally the, sur the radical surgery is no, no, no less than radical mutilation of our young people, castrating boys uh, and doing horrible Frankenstein-type operations on girls to help them create a, an artificial male genitalia. I mean, the whole thing is just, mm -hmm. it's a stuff of nightmares. And it's, it's, it's impossible to imagine that this is actually not only going on, but encouraged. And actually, anyone who discourages it is being canceled and ruled out. Mm -hmm. Father, years ago at Johns Hopkins University, the head, I believe, their psychiatric medical director said, we must stop doing gender reassignment surgeries because the outcome is not creating peace for these young people, it's creating disturbance. There was a survey that said approximately the rate of suicide post-gender transition surgery was 20 times the population average. So what has happened, and we need to look at this as researchers, as psychologists, what has happened is this is not correcting nature's mistake, it is causing much more complications, psychologically, emotionally, socially, and, biologically. And, and some of the case histories are, are such that the um, ramifications and the tragedy and the sense of loss and the sense of uh, despair after having done this radical uh, surgery actually only echoes down 20 or 30 year, years later, sometimes when the person is in old age. Um, I read a, a case history recently of a man who had gone through the transition to become a woman, and it was only when he was an old man that he actually realized um, what he'd done, and it, it registered. And his, he was at this point he was going through dementia, and his 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 dealing with old age was much more difficult and much more tragic uh, uh, since he had he'd, he'd gone through this problem. I see now many many parents coming to me far more than. 15 years ago, I, 15 years ago as a psychologist, I almost never saw this. Now it's one of the top referrals I receive from a parent confused by their child's struggle. And the argument is, well, of course, these children are now free to express who they really are. If that were totally the case, why are we not seeing similar things happening in 30, 40, and 50-year-olds who have decided, in fact, I've lived in the wrong body all these years. This is predominantly a teenage young person phenomenon. Uh, just real quick, I, I mean, it's being pushed everywhere because we have seven children and four of them are teenage girls right now. And right after I had the conversation with one of my daughters about what we're talking about, I went on to um, our Catholic hospital um, digital sign in. And when I was signing her in and setting up her profile, the Catholic hospital had a question, what is your biological sex? What gender do you identify as? And it, it sort of just like blew up everything I had just said to my daughter because even a, a Catholic hospital is asking, what gender do you identify as? Which leads me to a question for you, Father Dwight. You know, with regard to Holy Mother Church, I mean, our teaching is very clear, you know, and in, in sacred scripture states, you know, right in Genesis that, uh, we are created in the image and likeness of God, male and female. He created him, you know, and there you have it. So we have two genders. This is, this is not something that's fluid. You can do as much surgery and mutilation to your body as you want to do. You can identify as a different gender. But as you stated, Stacy, the fact of the matter is our, 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 our biological makeup at our, our, it, it, the cellular cellular level is always going to tell us who we are. The DNA is not going to change. Even the orientation of the human brain is different in a man and in a woman. So we cannot make that exchange and, and think that we're going to find any kind of peace and happiness, to your point, Dr. Ray, because it isn't there. Uh, the problem has got to be resolved prior to something that's going to just inflame the difficulty and the struggle that the human person is going through at, at this moment of confusion about gender.
I, I want to also stress how this is part of a much, much bigger issue. Okay, this is an issue that this is something which goes back into, as I was saying earlier, the whole confusion about what is sex, what is sex for, um, what, who are we, how are we created, what are we created for. Um, gender roles were actually defined, for instance, um, within the culture and within a larger culture and cultural environment. So, for instance, um, it was within the family and the extended family that a young boy learned how to be a man, how a young girl learned how to be a woman. And these gender roles are therefore being scrambled by our society and have been for the last 50 or 60 years. So, for instance, the feminist movement, which is very confused about what a, what a woman is and what a man is, the homosexualist movement, which is confused about what a man is and what a man is for and what a woman is for, all of these things, drag queens and all these kind of other issues, pornography, have all scrambled in the human mind what sex is and what it's for. And no wonder we're confused. No wonder there's all sorts of confusion because all of these other issues are part of that same problem. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ray, you had a comment you wanted to make. There was a survey that said approximately 80 to 90 percent of adolescent girls, by the time they reach the end of their teens, will reassert their biological sex. There's another survey that said about 20% of the kids surveyed said they identified as either transgender, sexually same attraction, or binary. 20%. For all of our surveys, as long as we've been taking them, that has been under 2 to 3%. Something. You have to look into this is making this happen at a rate six times, seven times history. Do you think that there could possibly be a scientific reason for that, Dr. Stacy? I, I don't think it's a scientific reason. I think it I think it has very much to do with the internet. I've you know I've been raising kids uh, like many parents for three decades now and I've watched what happened with the internet. The sense of identity has changed. I mean Kids have this digital construct unfettered by physical reality, and they, you know, a teenage girl has a hard enough time figuring out who she is. And when when she doesn't feel comfortable being a teenage girl, which frankly, all teenage girls go through that, um, they look for an escape. And it's easy to have an escape because all you have to do is define that you have a new reality, a new you're a new identity. And this is something that's been developed for a long time. Uh, one of the top executives at Google um, Ray Kurzweil, back in the 90s, was writing about this. He foresaw a day with the Internet when humans would no longer, it's called the singularity, when humans would no longer be our physical bodies, that we would be able to upload our brains into computers and be immortal. That That's what he was writing about. He predicted it would happen um, in 2020. It didn't. Something else happened in 2020. But I, I think it's a movement that's been a long time in the making. And I think uh, with kids growing up on the Internet now, this is just one um, detriment that we're seeing from that. Well, just, just to comment on what you're saying there, I was doing some research uh, into that very issue. And we see this whole movement towards transhumanism, where there are implants that can be put into our brain. There's all kinds of different apparatus that can be used uh, to basically make cyborgs out of the human person. And, and we come back to that very basic question, and, and that is the, the purpose for which we're created. And that brings us back to you again, Father Dwight, when we look at this reality. And there's also, I think, in the mix of all of this, you know, a kind of um, ethic. We're not looking at ethics ethics anymore in the same way. And I don't understand how it is that uh, doctors in good conscience can begin to uh, take uh, a human person and, and operate on them in these ways that, that, that make them something other than who they truly are, or at least attempt to do so, because you cannot change the reality of the human person, no matter what you do to that human person, but to enable them to live out the, the difficulty and the struggle that they're already dealing with, which only creates a, a greater issue. Issue. So when we look at, at the reality of the human person, how do we come back, do you think, Father Dwight, from this cliff that we're walking over? I, I think the reality of the human person means that in the church especially, we have to be clear about uh, gender roles. We have to clear, be clear about what a man is and what a woman is. One of the things which we've done in my parish in Greenville, South Carolina, is we've welcomed large families. 
okay, to our school and to our parish. And it's wonderful to see the naturalness of a large family with um, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or more kids uh, all bundling into our school, bundling into mass, playing together after mass, the boys throwing footballs, the girls talking and chatting amongst themselves in a way that you, we used to consider to be natural. And of course, it is natural. Uh, and it's within those environments, within the family, the extended family, the parish family, the church family, that boys and girls uh, get the po proper peer pressure where they have the proper relationships, which help them to understand uh, what boys and girls are in the school. We have uh, swing dancing in the uh, swing dances. We have uh, separate sexes for uh, for sports. Uh, I have altar boys, but not altar girls. We have boys clubs and girls clubs. We don't mix them together because this is all instrumental in helping young men, young people to to discern um, and to dis and to develop their God given sexuality. Uh, you use the word develop, and I want to come to you, Dr. Ray. You know, I, and uh, this is a very big uh, topic that I'm going to launch here, and I know we don't have the time to get into it deeply. But there is some developmental realities that are here, and and you talk about this this uh, the the way in which children uh, are are basically modeling after the parent of the same gender. We live in a time, a day and time, where homes are broken, where oftentimes the father figure is not there for the young man, the mom is away at work. How does all of that impact uh, the, the child developmentally with regard to these moments when they're looking at these big issues uh, in reference to themselves? Whatever creates growing up confusion opens the door for the child to make decisions that he may not be capable of making. A good parent guides a child on how to eat, how to dress, how to educate themselves. A good parent does all kinds of things against the child's preferences. Except in this area, we have convinced parents you are not allowed to question this because by questioning it, you could cause even more severe psychological problems. So many parents are paralyzed because they've heard all around them, don't tamper with this. The child is the ultimate authority at age four, at age six, at age 11, regarding what they wish to be sex-wise. This is something that has never happened before in human history, ever. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons is the Group under 35 is the most non-believing group we've ever surveyed. Roughly 40% of them have no religion whatsoever. So when you have no religion, it's very natural you are God. And if you are God, you can simply declare what is to be. And you do not need evidence. You do not need reason. You do not need logic. You know, Father talks about the church's wonderful view of the human person. But we don't need morality from the church to even make our case because our case squares with reality and science, as Stacy would say. I, I would also like to comment on the influence of feminism in our society. For decades now, radical, radical feminists have been uh, pressuring and pushing for not true femininity, but for women to become more like men. And so are we surprised, therefore, when another generation comes along of young women who are saying that they want to be men? I think the link is, the logical link and the cultural link is pretty strong. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, if we look back to the recent past, and, and here I'm talking about the, uh, the the rise of the feminist movement back in the 60s, uh, the, the entire... Uh, premise upon which that was built was that a woman had to be like a man if she was going to make it in the world. And the only way in which she could do that, uh, and this goes back to something that you mentioned earlier, Father Dwight, and that was to close her womb to life. And at that point then, uh, when you, you, you make a disconnect between uh, the procreative act uh, and, and the, the bearing of children, when you, when you make a separation between the actual sexual event and the bearing of children, then we begin to open up Pandora's box, and it seems as though a lot of this is, has, has come as a result of that. And, and I guess, you know, I, I want to ask you, Stacy, with, you know, here you are, you're raising these children today. Uh, the educational systems have been really, I think, very instrumental in pushing the, this agenda forward in public schools. Unfortunately, we're seeing some of this seeping into our Catholic schools, as you mentioned, with regard to the Catholic hospitals. So what do you suggest parents do? Pray a lot. Um, we ha we have to be ready. Think about what you're going to say, because if 
if your child comes to you, and I've heard many, te many teenagers ask this question, what if my friend comes to me and says that I identify as a different gender, what do I say? Like even the teenagers that understand, we want to support actual reality. It's not helping someone to deny reality, but they still don't know what to say. And uh, I think we need to come up with some, some language for parents to know what to say to their kids and for kids to know what to say to their friends. Um, it's always a good idea to reaffirm love. You know, I love you. I love you for who you are. I, I love you for who you actually are. You don't have to change your gender to be accepted. Um, I think parents need to be ready to say, if your child comes to you and says, I'm not a girl anymore, I'm now a guy, you've got to be ready to say, look, all I need you to be is my child. I love you and you're never going to lose my love. And I'm sorry that you're going through this. I'm really scared for what's going to happen for you, but you need to know I love you no matter what. I love you unconditionally. Stacy, I think a good place to start that conversation, and I tell this to parents all the time, how did you decide that? How did you come to that belief that you're in the wrong body? And typically the kids will share with you what the influences were. So now you can get a little more specific. You can realize what is uh, influencing them, persuading them, whether it's social media, they had a smartphone since they were 11, uh, what peers they're hanging around with, they have a, a peer that's gender confused, so that peer has convinced them. Whatever it might be, you got to get down to the specifics of how they came to this conclusion. Father Dwight, we only have about a minute left here, but I want to uh, just comment and then uh, basically ask you a question, and that is, I like what it is that you're doing in your parish, and you're helping these young men and young ladies to form good, healthy friendships. I think that one of the difficulties and struggles that we have today is we've forgotten what friendship is, and we automatically want to sexualize it. Uh, so would you respond to that, please? I think you've summed it up there, really. You know, someone said to me some time ago, what about these two guys who are living together? What does the church say about that? And I, they were challenging me because these men were uh, had same-sex attraction. Uh, and I said, well, if they're living together, we've n nobody's ever had any problems with a couple of guys being roommates. It's when they're sleeping together that we have a, we have a problem with it, okay? Mm -hmm. And so having a good friendship and developing a good friendship and same-sex friendships has always been important. Uh, and, it, and it's radically important for a, a full and a complete personality and a full and an abundant life. So we're not, of course, we're not against that. And we're not against people with same-sex attraction. And we're not against transsexual people. We're called to love all and accept all, but we're also called to um, hold up reality and talk about the reality of how we're created in God's, in God's image. Dr. Ray, Dr. Stacy, Father Dwight, thank you so very much for accepting our invitation. It's wonderful having had you with us today. And thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next week here on The Catholic Sphere.